Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Bill I'm an alcoholic. By the grace of God, I'm sober tonight, and that's the uh, most important thing that I will share with you from this podium, that it is by the grace of a loving God and the tender, loving care of people like you in rooms like this that I have awakened for the last 8,281 mornings without a hangover. Now, I'm going to prove to you that I know how the alcoholic mind works. Three-fourths of you are going, (laughs) trying to figure that out. That computes to July 26, 1982, and uh, that never ceases to amaze me. Um, I want to thank Jeff for the invitation to come up here. When he called me last summer, he said, come on up. It'll be nice and cool in North Dakota. (laughs) Boy, it doesn't exaggerate. And I especially want to thank Jim, he's a terrific host, he's made uh, my wife and me feel very welcome, very comfortable, <coughs> excuse me, and I've enjoyed the time we've had together and look forward to the rest of the weekend as well. I want to say at the outset that um, there was a time when I used to think that the the height of uh, stature you uh, achieve in Alcoholics Anonymous is speaker. It isn't. The height of achievement in Alcoholics Anonymous is sober. And, um, you know, we speakers get to sound authoritative when we come from a long way off. Now, I've come over a thousand miles. And uh, so I'm going to sound real authoritative tonight, or I would, except for the fact that my wife's sitting on the front row. (laughs) So you won't get to hear about my experiences when I was a U.S. astronaut. or an FBI agent, I have to stick to the truth tonight. It'll be kind of boring, but uh, I'm going to share it with you anyway. Um, I can tell you that I am an AA cheerleader. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Around my house, Alcoholics Anonymous is not a club. It's not an organization. It's not some outfit that I've joined I can assure you, when I was a kid growing up in the hills of North Georgia and making a list of all the clubs and organizations that I wanted to join, AA was not in the Hot 100. (laughs) But I can also tell you today that you can have all the rest of them if you leave me AA, because it is a way of life. Now, I want all of you to look around and see the empty chairs that are in here tonight, and when you run into somebody tomorrow and next week, uh, who was supposed to be sitting in one of these chairs, I want you to ask them, if it had been this cold on a night when they were still drinking, would they have stayed home? <laughs> Probably not. I was reminded of a uh, uh, an incident that uh, happened in Atlanta about 25 years ago when we had a uh, sudden snowstorm that hit Atlanta. Now, you got to remember, three inches of snow will shut down Atlanta. I mean, it closes down. Everybody goes home, and you go to the grocery store. There's a ritual. When it snows in Atlanta, within 20 minutes after they announce it on the radio, you can find no milk and no bread in any store. (laughs) Sometimes I think the grocery stores unload their excess by putting out that rumor. (laughs) But on this particular day, it had been down uh, around uh, uh, 8 or 10 degrees, and uh, the ground was frozen, and it began to snow. Now, we're accustomed to the first three or four hours of snow melting until the ground gets cold enough, and then it will start sticking. Not a flake melted. I sent my staff home, and I thought, well, I'll stay here and work for a little bit longer. Big mistake. I worked on a little while longer and then got out and got in my car and started home. Now, normally the drive from my house to, uh, from our, my office to our house was about, uh, 15 minutes. It took me three and a half hours to get home, slipping, sliding, dodging cars, 
I mean, in Atlanta, when a few flakes of snow fall, people go nuts. We don't know how to drive in this stuff. I was, you know, watching Jim today, just whipping around in all his ice and stuff. And, and he's a darn good driver. But in Atlanta, we'd be woof, 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 woof all over. <laughs> so I played Dodge Car all the way home as I skidded into the uh, driveway and into our carport, got out of the car, walked in the house, and all the way home I said, God, get me home. Please get me home safely. Get me home safely. And as I got out of the car to walk into the house, I thanked God for getting me home safely. Walked in the house and said, I need a drink. My wife said, we're out. We don't have anything. (laughs) Do I have to tell you guys what I did? (laughs) You know what I did. Right back out in that stuff. (laughs) And when I think about not going to an AA meeting, not going to my home group because of this excuse or that excuse, I remember that night. And I get up and I go. Um, But I go because there's something that I've discovered about Alcoholics Anonymous, and that is I like me better when I'm with you. I like me better when I'm with people who understand and know what I am. Because you see, I spent most of my uh, youth and well into my adulthood of not feeling that I belonged anywhere, not feeling that I fit in anywhere, um, of not feeling that anybody understood me, and most people didn't. And As the result, I always felt alienated from everybody. I always felt less than. I always felt like that uh, no matter how big a crowd of people I might happen to be with, I always felt like I was on the outside looking in. And the only time that changed, the first time that it changed was the first night that someone handed me a beer. And it was with a bunch of guys that uh, that I went to school with. That's one of my sponsees calling. God love him. They don't pay attention when you tell them when you're talking. <laughs> uh, I um, The first time that I was handed a beer was with a bunch of guys, and I don't know if it was peer pressure or curiosity or what, but someone handed me what I think, if I remember correctly, was a Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. And I turned it up and took a great big gulp. Gulp. And I thought I was going to throw up. That was the most vile, putrid, god-awful tasting stuff I'd ever put in my mouth. Which is probably explains why I only drank six that night. <laughs> the first time I drank, I got drunk. And I don't need to spend a lot of time discussing with you people what happened somewhere along between the second and the third drink. You know the little bell that went off in my head. Suddenly all that fear disappeared. Suddenly I was not outside looking in. I was in the middle of. Suddenly I felt smarter and wiser and handsomer and sexier than I'd ever felt in my entire life. Or for that matter, anybody I'd ever known in my entire life. And in that instant I thought I had found a friend It was going to be my friend for the rest of my life, no matter how bad it tasted. Also that night, I know today, there was set into motion certain beliefs that were to follow me until I found you people or you people found me and straightened out my thinking. But you see, I believed throughout all of my drinking career that everyone who drinks drank drank for the same reason that I did. They don't. For many, many people, alcohol does not do for them what it does for us. It doesn't alter their perception of reality. It doesn't create a false sense of security and all of these other things that it seems to do for us. The knowledge of that finally, at long last, explained to me some of the craziest behavior that I observed through my drinking career. 
For example, I never understood. I tried so hard to understand, but I never could understand the person who said, one's my limit. <laughs> Ain't that the dumbest remark you ever heard in your life? I've never wanted one of anything in my life. You know, in my drinking career, anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Uh, the one that was even crazier than that, and I still to this day don't understand the person who says this. Well, no, no, no more for me. I'm beginning to feel it. <laughs> what? I don't want to look and say, lady, that ain't where you quit. That's where you start. <laughs> That's why I went in the bar and sat down and had three or four shooters before I got down to serious drinking. I wanted to get to where she wanted to quit. Don't understand those people. Never did. Never will. And I also know today that they don't, cannot, and never will understand me. And I was convinced that nobody ever would. Um, I'd like to share with you tonight, as my experience, strength, and hope, what I used to be like, what happened, and what I am like now, in the form of what I call a search for it. At a very, very young age, I knew in my heart that something was missing from Bill Sanders. There was a layer of something that wasn't there. There was a component in my being or a circuit in my brain that had gotten left out. And that there was an it out there in the world somewhere that if I found it, I'd be okay. I would fit in. I would belong. I might even feel comfortable in my own skin. So I began a life quest for it. Now, that's a tough search, especially when you don't know what it is. You ever look for something and you don't know what it is you're looking for? You think you'll know when you find it. Maybe, maybe not. Well, I began the search for it, and I looked in high places and low places, uh, several times in my life, I thought I had found it. There was a period in my life when I thought, if I could find the right woman, that would be it. And I knew the one I was married to was not the right woman. I had messed that up good. So I began the search for the right woman. And I searched high and low. Mostly low. Um, and through the years of my drinking, I am not proud to say that I woke up many times in many strange beds with many strange people in many strange cities. And um, there are probably 25 or 30 times that I found the absolute perfect woman until the next morning. And she didn't seem quite so perfect as she had the night before. You see, my disease had these various sets of glasses that it uh, gave me. I think very appropriately, Chuck C.'s book uh, or his series of lectures called A New Pair of Glasses is very appropriate. I needed a new pair of glasses when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I had a disease of perception. I didn't perceive the world the, the world the way other people did. And and I saw through rose colored glasses many times when I was drinking that when I would come to, I would realize how crazy I was. And of course on those mornings I would swear I'm never, never, ever, ever, ever gonna drink again. And I would stick to that till three or four o'clock that afternoon. But I did find out one thing very early. That search for the right woman was not it. I uh, didn't drink that much in high school because um, uh, I came from a Southern Baptist upbringing. And um, if my 
God-fearing little mother, God rest her soul, had ever caught me drinking alcohol, I would not have needed AA. A mortician would have done the job just fine. But then I went off to college. And when I left my little hometown of less than 3,000 people, I was suddenly thrown into a university whose student population was more than three times the population of my hometown. And I had my first taste of anonymity. Nobody cared how much I drank. Nobody really even cared whether I came to class or not. They just as soon marked me absent as not. So I spent four years polishing my drinking skills, and I got good at it. Uh, and I would like to stand up here tonight and uh, share with you some of the wonderful, fond memories of my college career. I really would love to, if I could remember them. <laughs> but you see, I was beginning by this time to suffer from what we in North Georgia sometimes refer to as spells. You and I call them blackouts. <laughs> See, uh, 1962, that was a blackout. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but my behavior was um, out of line even for the University of Georgia. There's a grand tradition, for example, at the University of Georgia where after every Georgia football victory... They immediately, when the game is over, they begin to ring the chapel, chapel bell in the tower of uh, the chapel on the university campus, and they'll ring the bell until midnight. And they have bell ringers at 15-minute intervals. And the names of those bell ringers are entered in a, uh, a book that is kept in the University of Georgia library. And you can go back to the year 1905 when Georgia played Georgia Tech, and you can see who the bell ringers were at the various intervals. And uh, it's a great honor to be a bell ringer. I rang that bell. My name is not in that book. <laughs> now, that could have something to do with the fact that I was ringing the chapel bell at 3 a.m. on Easter Sunday. Now, in case a few of you are not big football fans, I can tell you the season's pretty well over by then. <laughs> and the dean of men did not think that was nearly as much fun as I did. That was one example. Throughout my college career, it's, uh, uh, well, put it this way, I finally exited the University of Georgia, and I did it with a diploma in my hand. I've never been sure if I earned it or they just got tired of my behavior and said, give them the darn thing and get him out of here. But I'm not giving it back. I've had it for over 30 years now, and I'm going to keep it. While at the University of Georgia, I um, on one night was in an apartment of a friend. My roommate and I were there, and uh, it was about eight or ten guys, and we were began drinking about eight o'clock at night. And at about two o'clock in the morning, I had uh, gone begun to go through the personality change and. Uh, by that time, I had reached my blithering idiot stage. And uh, the, the man whose apartment we were in had an antique gun collection on the wall that he was very proud of, worth many thousands of dollars. He had collected them for most of his life. And I jumped up off of the sofa and reached up and grabbed an old long barrel coat, 22 pistol, and started swinging it around through the air and acting like Wyatt Earp or Matt Dillon and said, stick up your hands, pointed the gun at my roommate, he threw his hands up in the air, and I pulled the trigger, and there was a sound like thunder. And in an instant, my roommate was lying on the floor in front of me in a pool of blood. They were to tell us a few hours later at a hospital in Athens, Georgia, that my roommate would live, but that he would never walk again. The bullet had severed his spine. A very strange thing happened in the early hours of that next morning in that hospital room. My roommate reached up from a hospital bed and put his hand on my arm and said, Bill, don't blame yourself. It was an accident. It could just as easily have been the other way around. Don't blame yourself. He forgave me immediately. But I did not forgive myself for more than 20 years. Because, you see, I didn't know how. 
It was not until you people gave me the wonder and the magic and the power of the fourth, the fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth steps that I was able to find forgiveness, to find peace, and to find some serenity. Instead of finding forgiveness after that incident, I crawled deeper into the bottle, and that's where I lived for many, many years. Not too long after that, I made my first attempt at ending my life. I took a, what doctors later determined who pumped me out, but somewhere between 50 and 60 sleeping pills, and ended up in the, the hospital being pumped out. Um, if you've never done that, it's not particularly fun, and I don't recommend it. Uh, but it was also around this time that uh, my family decided that uh, that I needed help. Now, when I get <clears throat> a thousand miles from Atlanta and away from the South, occasionally I'll have to explain a Southernism to you. And I'll do it by telling you this. The word H-E-L-P means that you require some assistance, that you need some assistance with something in your life. But if you need help, H-E-P, that means you're in deep doo-doo. <laughs> and I needed help. So I began my journey through God knows how many shrinks. I couldn't begin to tell you how many of those offices I visited, counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, psychological social workers, you name it, I went to them, left every one of their offices damning them because not one single one of them ever did one single thing to help me or help me. Now, we got this thing around this outfit called rigorous honesty. So I'm forced to admit to you that there is a remote possibility one or more of those guys might have been able to help me if I had ever once told them the truth. But typical alcoholic, around the third or fourth question, they'd say, do you think you might have a drinking problem? And my standard answer is, no, I drink fine. <laughs> and they'd go off treating something else. One of the shrinks I went to was a very famous one. Um, he and his partner had had a very famous patient, the woman who had three personalities living in their body. And uh, at the time, they had written a book about it, and the book had become a national bestseller. And at the time I was going to this doctor, they had just come out with a motion picture about this woman. It was called The Three Faces of Eve. And uh, Joanne Woodward won Best Actress. It got Best Picture that year. And it was all about this woman who had three personalities living inside her body. And I didn't get it. I didn't see what the big deal about that woman was. Because all I could think of... If I could get my personalities down to three, <laughs> I'd be home free. <laughs> but you see, I've always had these conventions that go on up here in my head. And the people in those conventions, they gather and discuss what bills ought to do or ought not do. Um, you, see, you know, you need to have a drink. Oh, you don't need to have a drink. Yeah, he does. He needs a drink. That's what will fix him up. He'll have a drink. And they'll go yap, 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 you know. And uh, I wish I could say when I got sober they went away, but they didn't. And I can tell you one thing. They don't like you people. They don't like you people at all. Matter of fact, when I'm with you people, they just sort of shut up and sit there. They don't say anything. Now, when I walk outside this meeting room tonight, they'll say... What in the world did you do that for? They didn't want to hear anything you had to say. What are you hanging out with these people for? Um, weird thing happens. If I happen to miss a couple of my home group meetings or if I miss a couple of the regular meetings that I go to, they'll start saying, see there, see there, you're doing fine. You don't need those meetings. You're doing just great. You don't need to go so many of those meetings. Why don't you cut back some? And there's something I've found out and I'd really like to share this with you, you newcomers, if there are any of you here, that every meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that I miss makes missing the next one easier. 
and it's only a matter of time before that little convention up there says, See there, you really don't need those meetings. You really don't need those people. And the next thing I know, they'll be wanting me to go to a bar to talk about it. How many people in here got under six months? Terrific. You're the main ones I'm talking to. The rest of these people, they know it all anyway. <laughs> I continued my search for it. I um, There was a time when I thought money was it. If I just had enough money. And through my career, there have been times in my career when I made, uh, before I retired, a lot of money. A great deal of money. And I found out money was not it. It absolutely was not it. Um, we were discussing driving from Fargo over here today uh, with Jim about um, uh, a man in the broadcasting business that I know very well who has made many hundreds of millions of dollars from Atlanta. And he is one of the unhappiest men that I know. Because there is never enough in his life. There is never any feeling of accomplishment of having reached some level of accomplishment. There's always got to be more, 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 more. And I learned for myself and through him that money is not it. There was a time in my life and in, when I thought stuff was it. If I just had enough stuff, and I bought a lot of stuff, TVs, VCRs, got a, uh, radios that would do this and would do that, and cars. You know, if I had the right car, that would be it. Stuff was not it. Matter of fact, we got a garage full of stuff. If any of y'all need some, just come by our house. And <laughs> we're trying to get rid of some more stuff right now. Stuff is not it. I thought that power was it. If I just had enough power, control over people, things. And I learned, though professionally I reached a stature of having a good deal of power. And ironically, the more power I gained in business, the more powerless my life became just as the steps told me long before I ever saw the steps. So my search for it continued. Not long after college, I um, decided to look for the right woman again. And um, I, 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 I moved to a town, another town in North Georgia, became a uh, news director of a uh, radio station. Uh, met a young lady on a blind date. Uh, I had to go on a blind date because she happened to be the daughter of my biggest client. And I didn't want to lose that money, so I went on that date with that girl, even though that's the last thing I wanted to do. Three months later, I asked her to marry me. Six months after that, we were married. And she became my first wife. And... Uh, I thought probably when I was, now that I was married, I needed to clean up my life and cut down on my drinking and be a responsible husband. It took me a very short time to learn that I did not need to do any such thing. That woman liked to drink just as much as I did. And we were a pair. You know, you hear people say that their relationship or their marriage has failed because of problems of communication. Then I can honestly say that my wife and I, we did not have that problem. Uh, we communicated. Uh, you could ask our neighbors three doors down the street, <laughs> and they'd tell you the Sanders communicate. <laughs> they could probably tell you what we were communicating about. And our communication sessions were very typical. I could hang in there with the best of them till it became apparent that I was on the losing end of the deal. And then I would go to plan B. Now, most of you know what plan B is. You grab your bottle, you storm out the back door, you slam the door, you jump in your car, you peel out of the driveway, squealing up the street, getting out of here. I don't need to stay here and listen to this crap. Over and over and over again it happened. 
<clears throat> one Sunday afternoon, we got into a discussion. There's no way I could lose. I had all of my facts, dates, places, names, numbers all together. No way I could lose. Ten minutes in, plan B. Grabbed my bottle, stormed out the back door, jumped in the car, peeled out of the driveway, squealed up the hill, out of the neighborhood, just like a hundred other times. Only one difference. That Sunday afternoon, I still had my pajamas on. <laughs> now, my wife did what any caring, loving, thoughtful wife would do. She called a friend to come get me and bring me home. The only thing wrong with that, the friend she called happened to be a police captain. He found me sitting in the parking lot of the Holiday Inn, minding my own business, sitting there talking to my bottle. And he came up and knocked on the car window. I looked up at him. I knew him immediately. He was an old friend. I said, hey, Harold. <laughs> he suggested I get out of my car and get in the car with him and that he'd take me home. And I told him that he could, uh, I said, no, thank you. Then, then he began to talk to me about his Marine Corps wrestling medals he had won and about the impact of that club he wore on his belt up the side of a human head. And, you know, it, it sort of began to make sense that I might want to consider going with him. I was drunk. I wasn't stupid. I also was not so drunk that I knew in about two turns after I got into that squad car with him, he wasn't heading toward my house. In about two more turns, I knew where he was headed because he pulled into the emergency room parking lot of a local hospital. Before I could issue a single word of protest, he had me out of that car, into that emergency room, checked in, upstairs, in a bed, flat out. Boom, boom, boom. I'm going to tell you something. You, you won't believe how fast you can get checked in a hospital when you already got your pajamas on. <laughs> Something about image. <laughs> Guy in his pajamas sitting in the lobby nursing a vodka bottle, you know. <laughs> it don't look good. Three weeks later, checked out of that hospital. Learned anything? Drunk before the sun went down. Now, I was a traveling drunk. I had to travel a good deal in my business. And uh, I had sort of a fear of flying. I didn't particularly like flying. Um, since I got sober, I've, I've probably flown more than I ever did drinking. Uh, and I've, I learned something that I'm really, really not afraid of flying at all. I'm afraid of falling, but I'm not afraid of flying. And, and, uh, but I'd get to the airport and I'd always have to get there early so I could go to the bar and have a couple of drinks before I got on that plane, you know, just kind of fortify my, my, uh, uh system. The only problem is, Sometimes, while I'm busy drinking, I'd forget to get on the plane. Um, Delta Airlines is headquartered in Atlanta, and they have a lot of great commercials that they run all over the United States. I've done some of those commercials through the years, and they used to have a slogan that says, Delta is ready when you are. Uh-uh. They'll leave you. <laughs> so I did what any good drunk would do. I got on another airplane, go somewhere else. <laughs> Called home that night. Wife says, how's the convention in New York? I don't know. I'm not in New York. <laughs> well, where are you? I'm in New Orleans. <laughs> you know how I knew I was in New Orleans? Because I pulled open the drawer of that dump night, a uh, little dump motel I was in. In a nightstand drawer, there was a telephone book. On the front, it said New Orleans. That's the only way I knew where I was. And, and, and you know, that was the kind of behavior that, that I did. I also used to consider myself a classy drinker. In my business career, uh, I had to do a lot of entertaining. And I would take people to the fanciest, nicest lounges in Atlanta. And, and, and there, there, were, there, were, there were places, restaurants in Atlanta, where I could walk in the door 
and and the deep pile carpet and the mater d in his tuxedo and his Portuguese accent would greet me at the door. Good day, Mr. Sanders. Welcome, Mr. Sanders. Right this way, Mr. Sanders. Now, the restaurant's this way. The bar's this way. He always went this way because he knew. I would walk through the do door of the bar, and the bartender, name, name uh, that particular place happened to be Jim, and uh, and uh, he would say, hello, Bill, come on in. And by the time I got from the door to my stool at the bar, he had my drink mixed sitting in front of me. And I would take people with me in there so they could see this because I knew this made a statement. Now, I know today it was not the statement I thought it was making, <laughs> but it was making a statement. Uh, I was also a, a, a very often a snobbish drinker. For example, uh, I would tell you that the optimum temperature for drinking vodka is 31.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And I believe that. Found out later I was wrong. The optimum temperature for drinking vodka is 108 degrees Fahrenheit. Don't shake your head. That's the temperature underneath the front seat of my car where I kept that vodka bottle. <laughs> Tasted just fine. As I said, I would drink in those class, fa fancy bars because I thought it was classy. Now, at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, I would be at bars in parts of town that nobody in their right mind goes to. Places where they have bars where your stature in the bar was measured by the size of your belt buckle. And you walk in there in a three-piece suit, you're going to stick out like a sore thumb. I never claimed to be a smart drunk. I would pick a fight with the biggest guy in the place. Always lost. But I was a classy drinker. Now I have to tell you tonight, when you wake up in the morning and you look down and there's dew all over your clothes and you blink your eyes and realize you're looking out from underneath a bush in a downtown Atlanta city park, there is nothing classy about that. You blink again and realize that you're looking out from underneath that bush up the nostrils of a policeman's horse. And the cop says, what are you doing here? And all I could think to say was, where is here? It is not classy when you're pulled from a car that you've planted into a steel post on the side of an Atlanta city street. Cop drug me out of that car cuffed me, put me in the cage in the back of the car, and off to the station house he went. Now, the whole trip there, I am busy telling this guy, I am not drunk. You were mistaken. You're making a big mistake. I'm not drunk. I've only had two beers. I'd like to share with you something that I firmly believe. I believe that there is a school somewhere that we are whisked off to sometime when we're in a blackout. And at that school, they instill in our head, if ever stopped by the cops, never admit to more than two beers. You ever watch these cop shows on TV? They drag them out of the car. They can't even stand up. All of them had two beers. Well, that night, I'd only had two beers. And I got to the police station. He put me on that breathalyzer. I blew into that thing, and it registered. Point two eight, And I told that cop, I said, that is absolutely impossible. There is no way on earth that I could register .28 on two beers. He agreed with me. <laughs> I can tell you right now, it was the only thing he agreed with me on that night. It is also not classy nor advisable when you go to court for a DUI don't go drunk. Not a good idea. Judges sort of frown on that. Now, since that was my first DUI, back then in Georgia, it's long gone now, but back then in Georgia, if it was your first DUI, you could plead no low contendery or no contest. They would slap you on the wrist, give you a small fine, not suspend your license, and it would not go on your record so as to to drive up your insurance. So a lawyer friend of mine had told me, when you go to court and they ask, how do you plead, simply say, no low contendery, and you'll be fine. I was drunk. 
I couldn't say no, 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 no guilty. And he threw the book at me. And that's being classy. You notice I haven't talked a great deal about my home life. Because I didn't have much of a home life. By now, my wife and I had had a beautiful little blue-eyed, blonde-haired baby girl who came along in 1970. She was beautiful. And I wish that I could say the first 12 years of her life that I was a good father. The only thing I can tell you is that I was a good sperm donor, and that's about the extent of it. I was not a father. I was not a daddy. I was at times gone more than I was home. I would make promises to be with the football game on Friday night to watch her do her little cheerleading with the peewee football. I would make the promise and then not show up. I would promise to take her to the Atlanta Zoo or to Six Flags over Georgia. And I would break that promise. And there were many nights that my first wife and I would be out drinking. Many times she off in her bars and me off in my bars. And sitting alone at home in an apartment would be that little beautiful blue-eyed blonde-haired girl dialing phone numbers that she'd memorized of bars all over town. Is my mommy there? Is my daddy there? The phone would ring and the bartender would answer, turn to me and said, it's your kid. And I'd answer the phone and a trembling little voice on the other end would say, Daddy, please come home. I'm scared. Where's your mom? I don't know, Daddy. Please come home. And you know the answer I gave her. I'll be home just as soon as I have one more drink. You also know that many hours and many drinks later, I would stumble into that apartment. And there cowering in the corner of the bed, trembling, tears streaming down her face, was that beautiful little girl. But you see, my disease had given me a set of blinders. It did not allow me to see the obvious in front of me. For many, many years, I said, get out of my face. My drinking doesn't affect anybody but me. It's none of your business. I did not realize that I was contaminating the lives of every single person I came in contact with. And most of all, and especially that little girl. In changing the mattress on her bed, one time her mother and I found uh, under the mattress a, a diary. And I did what I shouldn't have done. I opened the diary and read it. And the words jumped off the page to me. Today I wish my daddy was dead. And maybe there would be some peace in our home. But the blinders were firmly in place. My wife and I reached the point where she no longer asked where I was going when we leave the house. I no longer asked where she was going because I did not care, nor did she. I think our daughter was praying that I wouldn't come home, probably ever. So one night when my wife left the house and was gone for several hours, when she left, I'm sitting in front of the TV my vodka bottle in my hand, staring at the television screen. About three hours later, she comes back into the house. I'm still sitting there, nursing that vodka bottle, staring at that television screen, probably trying to decide whether to turn it on or not. And uh, my wife came and stood in front of me and said, guess where I've been? And I said, who gives a... Uh, who cares? And she didn't say anything. She did something really weird. She flipped a white poker chip into my lap. Now, I looked down at that chip, and I looked back at her, and I looked back at it, and I looked back at her. And I said, I don't have any idea where you've been, but if that's all you won, you had a lousy night. From well, the part of the country where I come from, I looked down again, and that little chip had two A's on it. She had picked up what we refer to as a surrender chip 
at an A and A meeting, and she told me where she'd been, and I went into an absolute flying clue perfect rage because I knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that that woman was not an alcoholic. I knew it. I had no doubt whatsoever. If she was an alcoholic, she just couldn't be an alcoholic. That's all there was to it. <laughs> but you know what? She didn't care what I thought. She started going to meetings and going to meetings and going to meetings and going to meetings. Some dang fool nonsense about 90, 90, and 90-something. 90 and I kept waiting for the other shoe to fall. I kept waiting for her to say, you need this ten times worse than I do. You're a bigger drunk than I am. Da -da -da -da. Didn't do it. Never said a word. Never made an accusation. Never pointed a finger. Just kept going to meetings and going to meetings. Oh, there were, there were some little clues left around the house, like I go in and lift the toilet seat, and there's how it works, pasted to the... <laughs> Eventually, the other shoe did fall. She came home one afternoon and said, uh, I'm picking up a 90-day chip tonight, and I'd like for you to be there. Uh-uh, no way, not in this life. A few tears, a few pleas, and a few deals, and finally I said, I'll go on one condition. I'm going in my car. See, she'd be gone two or three hours sometime. And I'd say, how long are those meetings? An hour. Why are you gone three hours? Oh, we go to Coco's after the meeting and have coffee. Yeah, right. I didn't know where she went, but I knew I wasn't going. So I said, where are we going? She said, we're going to a place called the 8111 Club. I said, where is that? She said, just follow me. I'll show you. A couple of miles from our house, she turned in the driveway of a pretty little house sitting up on the hill in a grove of trees. It was a home that had been converted into an AA clubhouse. Now, I had passed that house hundreds of times on the way home from the bar. And many times I would look up there. And look at all those cars, and I'd say to myself, Bill, you ought to get to know the guy that lives in that house because he obviously has a party every night. <laughs> well, that night, old Bill went to the party. I slid in behind a post in the back of the room, and uh, for the next hour, I witnessed the biggest bunch of weirdos I had ever seen in my entire life. They read all that stuff at the beginning of the meeting. I didn't understand any of it. And, and, and they got, finally got through with all that reading. And there's this guy doing this, waving his arms like, and I said, my God, why didn't somebody tell him to go on to the bathroom and get it over with? They pointed to him and he stood up and right out loud, he said his name and that he was an alcoholic. Now I'm thinking, I don't think I'd have told that if I'd have been him. And he added to it that he had gotten three DUIs. And you know what those people did? They busted out laughing. I never want to forget the thought that was going through my mind of what are these people laughing about? Don't they know what they are? They're alcoholics. They've got nothing to laugh about. I say that because I can tell you today, I thank God every day of my life for the laughter that we share in these rooms because there's magic and there's power and there's healing in that laughter. And I like to tell people, if you don't have a home group that laughs a lot, go find one that does. I also like to caution the newcomers not to laugh all the time or they'll come get you. <laughs> but I didn't get it that night. Next guy raised his hand and said he'd gotten six DUIs and been arrested for indecent exposure. They came unglued. I thought, my God, if they knew some of the stuff that happened to me, I'd sound like Richard Pryor. <laughs> Meeting seemed like it went on forever, and finally everybody stood up, grabbed hands, and said the only thing that was familiar to me that whole night, and that was the Lord's Prayer. And then I started for the door getting out of that place. Remember, I went in my own car. I struck out across the parking lot. I made it about two-thirds of the way to my car, and something grabbed me by the shoulder. It felt like a steel vice spun me around, and I found myself looking up into the face of a man seven feet, 11 inches tall. I can tell you tonight, he's not but 6'6", six, six, but he looked a whole lot taller that night. 
I also remembered this guy from the meeting because he was a little different from everybody else in the meeting. Most people said, my name's Jim, I'm an alcoholic. My name's Mary, I'm an alcoholic. My name's Tom, I'm an alcoholic. This guy was different. When they called on him, he stood up and said, my name's Floyd and I'm a grateful hillbilly drunk. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> this guy starts talking to me about drinking moonshine up in the mountains and 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 about... Um, his, his DUI he got driving the school bus and, and, uh, <laughs> I'm thinking, why in God's name is he telling me all this? The guy don't even know who I am. I found out later he knew exactly who I was because she'd been talking about me in those meetings. <laughs> But this guy's going by, blah, 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 people getting out and coming in and getting their cars and driving off. And remember, I came in my car. My wife comes out and goes, bye, gets in her car and leaves. <laughs> and it's me and Floyd. And he talks to me about getting drunk out in the woods in the wintertime and falling down on the ground and his face freezing to the ground. <laughs> and they had to pour coffee on him to get him up. <laughs> Now, I'm not hearing most of this. I'm busy making a deal with God. <laughs> well, Floyd talked on there for, I don't know, three, four days. <laughs> I finally broke away from him, got in the car, drove home, walked in the house. My wife started to say something. I said, don't open your mouth. Don't you ever try to get me back into that nut bin again. And he didn't. She didn't. But that roller coaster ride continued down. The loneliness got worse. The pain got unbearable. The feeling of not belonging reached its epitome. And the search for it was over. There was no it. On the afternoon of July 26, 1982, I came out of a week-long blackout drunk whole week missing. When I came out of that blackout, I'm sitting in my recliner chair at home, and I look down, and my left hand is an empty bottle, and in my right hand is a fully loaded and cocked 22 pistol, and I had not remembered picking up either one of them. And the thought going through my head was this, is this all there is? Is this really all there is? Because if it is, you can have it. A wife who doesn't give a damn whether I live or die. A daughter who wishes that I would. My life is in shambles. My friends are gone. I'm broke. And through the fog of that hangover of a, about twilight time on a Monday evening, there came a voice. Voice of God? Not exactly. The voice of an angel? No. It was the voice of a beautiful, wonderful, lovable, strapping, hillbilly drunk named Floyd. And the words that cut through the pain of that hangover were simply this. I'd remembered him saying, When I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, I expected God to open the gates of heaven and let me in. He didn't, but he opened the gates of hell and let me out. And if where I was on the evening of July 26, 1982, can be any closer to hell, I hope I'd never know it. I got up out of my chair and I went in the bathroom and I cleaned myself up the best I could, gargled about a half a bottle of Listerine, drank the rest. <laughs> Got in my car and drove back to that little house on the hill and walked in and slid down behind that post in the back of the room and peeked around the front of the room. Now, I don't know about you people, but the God of my understanding has a sense of humor. Sitting there at the front of the room, leading that me, uh, chairing that meeting, was my wife. She didn't see me until the end of that meeting when a man got up and explained the chip system that we use in the South. 
And he explained that that white chip, if you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, if you want to stop drinking just one day at a time, you want to surrender to your disease, come and pick up this chip. And I got out of my chair and I took the longest walk I've ever taken in my life to the front of that room. And a man pressed a white poker chip into my trembling, sweating hand. And I went back and sat down. I choose, from the bottom of my heart, to believe that an old Bill Sanders walked to the front of that room that night and died. And that a new one walked away. Because by the grace of God and the tender loving care of people like you in rooms like this, as I said at the beginning, I haven't had to have a drink since that night. I thank you for that. You told me very quickly I needed to get a sponsor. Now, I've been in broadcasting for most of my career. I had lots of sponsors. <laughs> Can't have radio and TV shows without sponsors. They explained to me that was not what they were talking about. When they explained what a sponsor was, I decided to do that scientifically. I decided I'd look around for the sweetest, kindest, roly-poliest, white-haired old granddaddy that I could find. One that I knew would pat me on the head on a daily basis, tell me what a good boy I was, and that he'd never seen anybody work those steps as well as I did, and that he wouldn't change a thing. It took me about three weeks. I found him, snow-white hair, roly polier than me, and a big smile plastered all over his face all the time. And I asked a man named Doc Crandall to be my sponsor. Biggest mistake I ever made in my life. I don't remember that man ever telling me one thing I wanted to hear. I knew I was in trouble the first night I asked him, sure, I'll be your sponsor, be glad to be your sponsor. <coughs> Let's discuss the rules. Rules? What rules? <laughs> oh, he's nothing. It's very simple. First thing you're going to do every morning, you're going to roll out of that bed onto your knees, and you're going to ask the God, as you understand him, to keep you sober today. And at the end of your day, you're going to get back down on your knees before you get into that bed, and you're going to say thank you. I said, now, wait a minute, Doc. I grew up Southern Baptist. When I was a kid and they opened the church doors, we were there. Uh, I know... Praying's important, all open meetings, closed meetings, do all this stuff about prayer. But i got to be honest with you, I'm not comfortable with this knee business. He said, I don't remember saying a damn thing about you being comfortable. <laughs> and I was a cocky, smart aleck newcomer. I said, Doc, from what I hear around here, this is supposed to be a program of suggestion. He says, it is. I suggest you do it or get you another sponsor. <laughs> Once he explained it that way, you know. <laughs> he also put that book in my hand. He said, I want you to take this book home and I want you to study, not read, study the first 164 pages of that book. And when you do that for a few weeks, you come back and we're going to sit down and talk about those steps in Chapter 5 and how you can use them in your life. And I thought, well, I can get into that, you know. I stopped at the office supply place, and I got me some highlighters and a couple of legal pads, and I got me some uh, uh, those sharp pencils and went home and got them uh, sharp and sharp as I could, and I cleared off my desk, and I spread it all out, and I went through that book. And I was highlighting, and I was underlining, and I was making notes, and I struck through the steps that didn't have anything to do with me, and, and I, uh, I jotted down a few I thought of that they hadn't when they wrote that book. And um, about three weeks... I called Doc. I said, I'm ready to talk. He said, hot dog, come on over. I went over to his house and sat down in his den. He reared back in his old recliner chair, and I sat down on the sofa and spread all my stuff out on the coffee table. He said, all right, son, lay it on me. I said, okie doke. I flipped the book open to chapter 5, and I pointed down. I said, okay. <clears throat> Doc, looking at this first step, as I interpret, and that's as far as I got, <laughs> boy, that step don't need your interpreting. It needs your doing. Yeah, but, 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 but Doc, what, 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 what I think it means is, he said, Bill, look closely, son. It's in English. It says exactly what it means. And if you'll look real close, you'll notice they put little numbers by those steps so smart college boys like you can follow along. <laughs> God, he was tough. 
I remember one day I had a personnel problem at work. And I thought about Doc. I said, you know, he's had a lot more business experience than I have. I called him. I said, can you got a few minutes before the meeting tonight we can talk? I got something I need to talk to you about. Sure. We got there early, got us a cup of coffee, walked out under a tree in the back of the club. And I said, Doc, I got a personnel problem at work that I need some help with. Let me lay the situation out to you. He said, hang on. Whoa, one second. Let me ask you one question. What step are you using on this? I said, what? What step are you using on this problem? I said, no, 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 no. You don't understand, Doc. I'm talking about a personnel problem at work, real life stuff, not AA stuff. He said, go home and look again. I went home. I got the book down. I went through the steps. There wasn't a thing in there about personnel problems. Went back the next night. Doc, look, wasn't anything about personnel. Let me lay out the situation. I've got this. He said, wait a minute. Go look again. I'm driving home thinking, God almighty, that crazy old bastard. <laughs> but I humor him. I got the book down. I went over to go through the steps. Da, 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 da. There it was. There was the answer. Over and over and over again, he kept sending me back to that book, back to those steps, until one day the little bell finally went off up here that there is nothing, nothing, nothing that is going to happen in the life of this alcoholic that the answer is in that book and in those steps. I believe that to the bottom of my heart. And there's something else I've learned. That is a magic book. It is a magic book. You remember a couple of years ago we made a big whoop to do about coming out with the fourth edition of the big book? I was thinking, you know, I don't know what the big deal is about that. Because at the time I was reading the 26th edition of the big book. That's how many times I've read that book from cover to cover. And every time I read it, they've rewritten that sucker. There is stuff in there that was not there the last time I read that book. I know, because like I told you, I'm a highlighter and an underliner. There's stuff over here on this page. I don't know who underlined that. That's no big deal. But this, look at this. That wasn't in there the last time I read it. I shared that from a podium a few years ago out in California. The young lady came up to me after the meeting and said, you really believe that? And I told her, no, but I believe God speaks to me through that book. And he reveals himself to me when I need it through the words of that book. And if I fail to pick up that book and read it, I'm going to miss a message that he's got from me. That's why I pick it up and read it on a regular basis. That's why I go to big book meetings. It's also why I go to AA meetings, and a lot of them. My sponsor, Doc, used to say, Boy, you missed a great meeting last night. I heard something absolutely fantastic that I need to hear. What? What'd you hear? He said, well, I don't know. I didn't hear what you needed to hear. I heard what I needed to hear. <laughs> you missed what you needed to hear. I asked him one time, I said, Doc, do you think maybe God speaks to us through other people? He kind of rolled his eyes and said, Bill, what do you think he speaks through, Frisbees? <laughs> So I pray for God's will and then to go to a meeting and find out what it is because he speaks to me through you people. He made me an AA cheerleader. He made me fall in love with this fellowship and with that book and with sponsorship. I love sponsorship. I remember when Doc used to tell me, I get more out of this than you do. I thought that's a nice thing to say. It's a bunch of baloney, but it's a nice thing to say. But I can tell you now, the day that my sponsor, Doc, went on a 12-step call and never came home, I learned what he meant. As my sponsor and another man struggled to take a shotgun away from a suicidal young alcoholic that Doc had been trying to help get sober, the shotgun accidentally discharged, and my sponsor died, caught the blast in the stomach, and died before he reached the hospital. He gave his life doing what he loved doing the most, trying to save a drunk. That evening, sitting in the den of his home, I felt a loneliness come over me that I hadn't felt in a long time. I felt a pain. I felt a fear that I hadn't felt in several years. In the quiet stillness of this evening, I kept thinking, how can I go on? How can I stay sober without the man by my side who carried me, who planted me in this program, who gave me these steps? 
In the quiet stillness of the evening, the answer came. You'll do it by doing what he taught you to do. And what his sponsor before him and his sponsor before him and his sponsor before him. All the way back to that fateful night in the spring of 1935 when the broken down stockbroker and the has-been doctor sat in that gatehouse in Akron, Ohio and said, do you think we might stay sober if we help one another? See, I believe in 1935 that God in his infinite and compassionate wisdom looked down and said the lowly alcoholic has suffered for long enough, has been the outcast of the world for long enough. I've got to give him a way out. And what a way he gave us. He could have declared that we all be shut away in, in sanitariums or in colonies like lepers so we couldn't contaminate society. He could have condemned us to be locked away in prisons as many of us were and should have stayed. He could have condemned us to death. But instead he gave us each other in more love and more laughter and more joy and more happiness than most of us would ever know in a hundred lifetimes. And you'll never convince this alcoholic that he didn't top it off with one more thing. I believe he topped it off with a one-on-one, -on -one, face to face relationship with him that most people on this earth will never know. I believe that we are the luckiest people who walk the face of God's earth. We have the greatest gift that God has ever given mankind. After my sponsor's death, I was surrounded by the most wonderful bunch of young snot-nosed sponsees that anybody could ever have. Those little characters dragged me to meetings when I wanted to isolate. They made me share when I wanted to hide. And they loved me and they cared for me until I could walk the walk and talk the talk again. And I love them for it. Sponsorship to me is all about another drunk walking the same road that I'm walking, shining a light on the path for me. And that's what I try to do for my sponsees. And, and the wonderful thing about sponsorship is, as I was sharing with Jim today, you get to relive your own sobriety through them. They'll drag you back through the steps whether you want to go or not. Sponsor, here in the big book, it says something about so-and-so and so-and-so. What does that mean? Uh, let me think about that. Run home, get the book down. <laughs> Where did it say that? Back through the book again. I had a young sponsee who came into the spon uh, into AA uh, about 15, 17 years ago. He was a young African-American off the streets of Atlanta, dope dealer, car thief, stole, tried to sell a stolen car to an undercover cop and got caught, dragged into courtroom in DeKalb County, east of Atlanta, and got sentenced, served his time, got out, decided to straighten his life out and check out AA. So he came. And he's one of those people that wrap both arms and both legs around this fellowship. Decided he wanted to finish his college degree. He finished his college degree. Went to law school. Graduated law school. Went to a law firm in Atlanta and got a job. Spent several years there and then opened his own law firm. And in September of last year, I stood with other people in a courtroom the same courtroom where he had been sentenced. And I watched this man sworn in as a judge. You see, you can't get here from where he came from. But by the grace of God. You can't get where I am. You can't get where you are. But by the grace of God. We're walking, talking, breathing miracles. I refer to that woman the beginning of my story is my first wife because you see I'm not married to the same woman anymore and thank God she's not married to the same man anymore we're the same bodies but we're not the same people you changed all that that woman that I knew was not the right person for me in my life today is my best friend my buddy my lover my soulmate and I'd rather be with her than any person on the face of this earth we fit like a pair of old shoes I love you stand up and Give him a smile. <laughs> Today I have a wonderful relationship with a beautiful little blue-eyed, blonde-haired girl who is now in her 30s. And I walked her down the aisle at her wedding at her request. She had me dance with her at the reception, and she wouldn't tell me what the song would be until we got on the dance floor. 
And she looked into my eyes. Instead of fear and hate and result, I saw love and I saw respect. And the music began, and the words of the song she had chosen were, Did you ever know that you're my hero? In everything I want to be, I can fly higher than an eagle. You're the wind beneath my wings. What a gift you people had given me. This family that had been ripped and shredded and torn apart by the insidious, relentless disease called alcoholism. You people, meeting by meeting, step by step, prayer by prayer, sponsor by sponsor, put this family back together again. And a few years ago, I was sitting in an AA meeting. You know how we are when they're doing the readings at the beginning of the meeting, how it works and the traditions. We're not listening. Unless somebody makes a mistake, we go, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> they ain't right. But that night, for some whatever reason, I happened to be listening. And at one point in there, the man reading it said, if you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, you had it that I had been looking for right here in these rooms. You had it all the time. You had the it that was missing in my life. You had the it that would fill that hole. That it was a thing called God, called spirituality. And I love you for that. About two and a half years ago, I stood beside my daughter's bed in a hospital. And she reached up from a hospital bed and she put into my arms a beautiful, blue-eyed, blonde-haired baby boy. She said, meet your grandpa. He's the greatest. Five months ago, she put another beautiful baby boy into my arms and said the same words. And she said, guess what? We've named him. And he has my name. You gave me that. You gave me that. So it cannot possibly come as a surprise that I would conclude tonight by saying to you, did you ever know you are my heroes? You're everything I have ever searched for and wanted to be. And I believe with all my heart that every single one of us can soar like an eagle because he's the wind beneath our wings. Thank you for having me. God bless you. Good night. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.